right, so um, I'm going to talk about a similar story, but in a slightly different light. Um, <laughs> My, my background is that I'm actually a rap artist by trade, although I rap about unusual things. And a few years ago, I was in the UK touring a previous show that I did called The Rap Canterbury Tales, where I took Geoffrey Chaucer's stories and retold them as hip hop songs. And um, as, as, as I was performing the show in the UK, a geneticist happened to see it. He works at the uh, University of Birmingham. His name is Dr. Mark Palin. And he contacted me in 2008. And he said, Baba, next year is Charles Darwin's 200th birthday. I'm organizing a special symposium where scientists are going to give lectures on biology, and I need some entertainment. Would you be able to write me some evolutionary raps? His exact words were, would you be able to do for Darwin what you did for Chaucer? Um, I, <laughs> I thought that sounded like a good challenge. Um, so I took up the gauntlet, but the condition was, of course, that I had to send him drafts of my lyrics so he could correct them for scientific accuracy, because uh, he didn't want to embarrass himself in front of his peers. So um, basically, what that means is, after going through this process, I have a hip hop show that's peer reviewed. So I'm going to be. <laughs> I will be doing some peer-reviewed rapping in my talk today. Um, the challenge with this was to try to find a way to make the evolutionary story relevant to everyone. And, um, and one of the ways that I did this was by looking at evolutionary psychology, which is the study of human behavior, human attitudes, and human beliefs from the perspective of Darwinian evolution. I'm not going to try to redeem everything evolutionary psychologists have tried to claim. But I'm going to look at one study and try to contextualize it for you guys to try to show um, the, the picture of an evolved mind. So this is from a book called homicide, and I have some data here. This is different neighborhoods in the city of Chicago, and what they've done is they've looked at the homicide and violent crime rates, and they've looked at how they correlate with the male life expectancy at birth. Look how closely that correlates. High life expectancy predicts low homicide rates and vice versa. Now, this is just one city, but if you look at this same data for different countries, it actually turns out to be a very similar pattern around the world. Life expectancy predicts violent crime, okay? And so what they've argued in this book is that basically what we call violent crime and murder, what what this actually is, is aggressive young men competing for status and respect in environments where they don't have the opportunity to compete using forms of comp competition that we consider pro-social, like the arts, or like sports, or like music, or like education, or like jobs. If those low-risk forms of competition are present, young men will prefer them. But if they're not present, they are predetermined by evolution, pre, uh, predisposed to find a way to compete for distinction and status with their peers, and they will choose violence if it's the only means available. Because whatever you can do, you can always fight. Now, at this point, you'll notice I'm being very gendered, very exclusive. I'm saying young men instead of young people. Is that just to make the ladies feel left out? No. They found a little disparity between the number of murders caused by males versus the number of murders caused by females as a universal phenomenon. It's approximately 94 to 6 percent. <laughs> and it, it fluctuates by a few percentage points, but in no society is it less than 90. Let that sink in. More than 90% of violent crimes and murders around the world in every culture are committed by young men, not young women. And I'll wager that was a young man who crashed that bottle just right there as well. <laughs> yeah. Something about them is just has this aggressiveness to it. And here's, an, here's um, another uh, um, survey from the same study, which looks at the age of the perpetrator and the murder rate for various areas. Now, notice that a 10-year-old girl and a 10-year-old boy are equally likely to commit a murder. Little angels, huh? But they've split the genders here. And look what happens at age 14. Boom, the boys spike off the charts, and the girls stay pretty much the same. What happens at age 14? Is that when these, is that when these young men get socialized by their societies by playing with GI Joes to become violent? Or maybe there's a hormonal thing that kicks in at puberty that says, compete with your peers for status. And what you're seeing right there is the results. Now, um, this is the city of Chicago, but look at this. This is the entire country of Canada. We have almost the exact same pattern, and this is all the murders in male and female in different ages, all right? So um, basically, oh yeah, by the way, there's another um, chart that I don't have here, but that would show the exact opposite pattern with the females spiking at pretty much the exact same age and the males staying pretty much flat. I, guess, I, bet, you, I bet you can guess what that one, that one would be, of course, teenage pregnancy, right? Um, except, the <laughs> except, except the male line would actually stay flat. 
not, not, not the little bump there. Um, but so, uh, and, and, and what they've argued in the book is basically that um, young women take in signals from their environment about their prospects of longevity and adjust their reproductive decisions accordingly. Because if everyone in your environment where you grew up is dying in their 40s, you can't wait till you're 38 and have a great career to have your first baby like everybody does in New York and London, right? You're not going to get to spend much time with your kid. So you might speed that decision up, right? So the general theory of the book is that males and females have slightly different strategies, but we all take in signals from our environment about our prospects for longevity, our prospects in life, and then we adjust our attitudes and behaviors in order to maximize our inclusive fitness, our survival and reproduction prospects. Now, you might agree with that theory, you might not, but think about this. If that's true, doesn't that explain so much about rap music? Man, I listened to rap music my whole life, and all you hear is murder, 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 kill a motherfucker, and I was always like, why are they so mad? I don't understand. <laughs> But as soon as I read this book, I was like, oh, now I understand. These are people from dangerous urban environments who have low life expectancies. And by the way, another really strong predicting factor is the disparity of wealth distribution. The more unevenly distributed the wealth, the higher the violent crime and the higher the teenage pregnancy. And that's also a universal phenomenon around the world. So then I thought, what if rap music was by people who had gone through those hardships, but also understood the evolved psychology behind their aggressive responses and could use that knowledge to make better decisions? What would rap sound like then? You're about to find out. <laughs> so what I did is I took a real rap song, and the original title was Survival of the Fittest. And, um, I, and these guys who wrote this song, they did actually grow up in a dangerous urban environment. I'm talking about Queens, New York in the 1990s. Now, interestingly enough, this song was made at around the exact same time as the book Homicide was being written, although I don't think they were collaborating for some reason. <laughs> but uh, the song reflects a lot of the themes. So what I'm going to do at this point, uh, does anyone here know what the rap group is that made the song uh, in the 1990s called Survival of the Fittest? Mob Deep, very good. Someone, uh, see, levels of hip hop literacy in the world today have gotten dangerously low. So it, it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's good to know that, that, that people are still educated. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remix Mob Deep as an evolutionary psychology lesson, which means at this point, I'm going to have to get into my criminal mindset. I'm going to have to get thugged out. <laughs> Your mocking laughter tells me you are not convinced. Of course, what I'm about to do is take on a persona, a gangster persona. But evolutionary psychologists usually argue that the degree of intentionality is not as important as the reproductive and survival consequences. In which case, this is a persona for me on the stage, but it's also a persona for Mob Deep. It's an adaptive persona, perhaps adopted by any organism of any species that evolves in an environment with high levels of predatory threat in which an aggressive deterrent response could increase their chances of surviving. Think Think about scorpions, think about tigers, think about geese, it's all the same, right? Don't fuck with me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the video that Mob Deep made in 1995, and you look at their body language and think about what they might be trying to signal to us as potential predators in their environment. Of course, for me, this is especially a persona because I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. <laughs> Sources of predatory threat for us were low. And one time when I said that in a talk, someone was like, what about grizzly bears? Mm. Uh, to give you a sense of proportion, approximately 50 people have died of grizzly bear attacks in the last 100 years in all of North America. So um, that's like two weeks in gun, of gun violence in Queens in the 90s. Our adaptive responses were different. But of course, you can have a persona, or you can have a persona of a persona of a persona. So when I start acting like a gangster, am I actually imitating Mob Deep, or am I imitating all the suburban white kids I grew up with who all decided for some reason they wanted to imitate Mob Deep. Or maybe I'm imitating a white kid who imitated an Asian kid who imitated a Hispanic kid who imitated Mob Deep. And how many times removed does it have to be to be authentic? And how do you know you're not a persona? Huh? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's do this. <laughs> I'm sending this one out to all my evolutionary psychologists. I'm talking Cosmides and Tubi, David Buss, Jeffrey Miller. Yeah, we live in this till the day that we die. Survival of the fit, only the strong survive. There's a war going on outside, no man is safe from. You could run, but you can't hide forever. You come to my block, you'll see some territoriality. A place where kill or be killed is the mentality. But get it straight, it's just a necessary strategy. You gotta play the hand you dealt. You can't magically escape from the habitat that you was born in. Three homicides in my neighborhood this morning. Cops 
came and kicked the crooked door in with no warning and started roughing up my young cousin. She is, she's only 17 and got a bun in the oven plus a concussion, but she ain't done nothing. So keep your mouth shut and don't jump to judgment on the lives we're living. Just close your eyes and listen while I break down some homicide statistics. So if you're thinking the criminal mind is just faking, you're mistaken. This is calculated risk taking. We living in a situation with a low life expectancy and a major discrepancy between the haves and the have nots. And you wonder why the padlock on every cash box is smashed off? Come on, you can't call it pathological. Nah, that's illogical. You can try to understand it, but you can't stop it though. Not unless you address the root causes, the conscious and unconscious decisions to discount future prospects. Come on, it's obvious the beat keeps bouncing. The homicide rate keeps mounting, which leads to steep discounting and a lot of violence. But it's not a virus. It's a rational response to high risk environments and short time horizons with high stakes and highly visible prizes and you wonder why we're criminal minded hey you can't say we'll get satisfaction if we're patient with self-control and delayed gratification when the only job that pays is casket making and death is the ultimate plan cancellation so check the facts and recent data releasing it shows a pattern of increasing competition a bunch of young guys all struggling and status seeking and causing the crimes that make the social fabric weaken and life expectancy also predicts teen pregnancy the need to leave a legacy genetically will never be completely controlled contraceptively yeah that's transparent imagine if you're kids would never meet their grandparents unless they followed the Bristol Palin plan for parenthood. And then they say, ooh, these young girls are so damn careless, getting pregnant before marriage, it's such a tragedy. Apparently it's also a reproductive strategy, especially when you can see them adjusting actively when the circumstances change. In both the cases of the young ladies with babies and the male risk takers, we see people adapting to their situations, and it's the same in different places and with different races. This is not about ethical justifications, it's evolutionary psych, and it's just the basics and still people call this behavior maladaptive because of our reaction when violence happens but if we really want to change the outcome then maybe we should just start questioning how it's adaptive and the bottom line is that iniquity and life expectancy are the ultimate causes of crime and the result of crime to me that's true the two combine together in a feedback loop but i've got some moves to make now so i'll be back soon just don't ask me what i'm about to do because I, I can't say, say so it's left an untold fact until my death my goals will stay alive survival of the fit only the strong survive that's right we live in this till the day that we die survival of the fit only the strong survive yes yeah, we live in this till the day that we die survival of the fit only the strong survive that's right we live in this till the day that we die survival of the fit only the strong only the strong yeah word up Thank you. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare leave things on that bleak of a note. So um, what we're going to do now for the last part of the talk is we're going to look at the evolutionary origins of altruism as sort of salve. That was about the origins of hostility and aggression. But cooperation and compassion also have an evolutionary dynamic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remix another rap song. And this is by some rappers from San Francisco. Yes, there are hippie rappers too. Um, to give you a sense of um, their hippie credentials, the group that made the song Worst Comes to Worst is called Dilated Peoples. So we're going to remix, <laughs> we're gonna remix Dilated Peoples um, with the great philosopher of humanism, Charles Darwin. Uh, slide advance, there we go. Who wrote in the defense of, uh, the descent of man, as man advances in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation, though personally unknown to him. This point being once reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and all races. Now, if you can excuse the Victorian paternalistic language that refers to human beings as men, we have a remarkable statement going on here. Darwin's basically saying, we are the world. <laughs> we are the people. All right, so let's try this out. Let's drop that V. Yeah. We gonna go to the bay. We gonna eat some bagels. We gonna do some yoga. Whatever, y'all. Yeah. It's like when worse come to worse, my people come first. But the question is, who are my people? Family members? People who look like me? Speak my language? People in my city? Why not everybody, right? Some people got good friends, I got disparate friends. They live on different ends of the earth. But just pretend that we actually get to the end of the time of tribalism like Obama said, and dissolve the lines of difference. As man advances in civilization and small tribes expand into larger bases and communities,
abilities The truest reason would tell each individual That it's not that difficult to extend our instinctual sympathies To all the members of one nation Like for instance, notice how everybody loves Canadians overseas Even if they're personally unknown Well so do I, but not so much when I come home But I know that there's nothing to stop me extending this basic sympathy To the people of all races and all nations By the way, those are Charles Darwin's statements paraphrased a man ahead of his time, extending his imagination and formidable mind into a future where all human sympathies combine. See what I'm saying? It's like when worse come to worse, my people come first. But if everybody on earth is my people, that's peace on earth, yeah? Peace on earth. Come on now. Throw your peace signs up. Everybody throw your peace signs up. What, we got arms dealers in the house? Come on, everybody. Yeah, even if you're backwards and offbeat, we can all get together. One world, right? Yeah. Spread the Darwinian love. Spread the objective altruism. Yeah. Thank you. So, that's all well and good, but how on earth would that bizarre behavior have evolved? I thought evolution was supposed to be um, survival of the fittest. It's all about genetic proliferation. Whoever gets the most copies of their genes into future generations wins. Go! Then how could you use that for loving the whole world, right? Where does, um, loving the whole world is a, is, a, is a sort of human aberration, but even in general, how would organisms evolve to help each other? So this is a really interesting debate that's going on in biology, and I'm just going to sort of try to frame it. There's no way to get through it all. Um, but what these are are dictyostelium amoebas, and they are all in competition. If there's food between them, they're going to fight for it. But when they run out of food, they signal to each other that says, things are no good here anymore. Let's get out of here. The signaling protein causes them to coordinate their behavior, and then they band together and form a multicellular uh, slug-looking thing. They call it it's a slime mold. Um, and then that thing crawls away as a multicellular cooperative organism to find a, a new, more habitable place for all of them. So they, they have a, a mechanism that they've evolved to switch from individually competing to cooperating for the collective gain of all of them. And when that, when that gets to its destination, it forms into a stalk, and the top of the stalk bursts, and they go off like spores on the wind, but the ones that made up the base of the stock have just committed suicide to help the ones at the top. So the big question is how would that behavior possibly evolve if the ones that always make up the base get deleted from the gene pool? And there's this debate going on, you know, this is one organism, but the question is how does altruism in general evolve? And um, some people say it's that organisms will only help their genetic relatives because they have copies of the same genes in them. That's kin selection. Some say that organisms will help each other uh, with the expectation that when they are in need later on that they will be helped, and that's reciprocal altruism, but then they need a mechanism to keep track, something like reputation or memory, which is how we keep track. But how would these guys keep track? Because they have no brains. Um, the third one that's the really controversial one is group selection, which says that groups of cooperative organisms will outcompete groups of selfish organisms in environmental circumstances where cooperation is necessary for survival. And there's a fascinating debate in biology about whether this is just a theoretical possibility or whether it's actually happened throughout history. And the previous speaker uh, mentioned E.O. Wilson, who's made, along with David Sloan Wilson, a very strong argument that it actually has happened rarely, but in certain circumstances, like with eusocial insects, and, and, and there's one form of mammal that's eusocial as well, which is the um, naked mole rat, and also in human beings. Human beings form coalitions, and they sometimes stand or fall based on their ability to cooperate. So I think this is the key question to deal with a lot of the social problems today. How do you take groups of selfish individuals and in induce them to become groups of cooperators for their collective survival. And there have been many cases throughout history where organisms who failed to cooperate have gone extinct. And some people say that we, as human beings, are on the brink of that right now. And we obviously have the ability to compete and the ability to cooperate. And evolution can teach us about what environmental circumstances and what, um, you know, and, and, and what ideas are necessary to try to uh, help us to get into the place where we're cooperators rather than comp um, competitors when survival is at stake. So um, you know, that's a very broad brush of the evolution of, uh, evolution of altruism. They call it the problem of altruism, which seems sort of derogatory. Like, what do you mean? Altruism is great. It's not a problem. But it's a problem when you're talking about genetic proliferation as the origins of evolution. So I, I encourage you all to look into this very much. And if you don't already, listen to more rap music. <laughs> These are testimonials, people. And they teach us a lot about the world that we live in today. Thank you very much.